God told me in particular to say this to the couples tonight, that before we can officially move into what God would like to tell you tonight, there has to be, if you will, a house cleaning. And a, uh, in order to cause two pieces of wood to come together, you must smooth out each individual pieces of wood rough edges. And then you can seal them together. And so God wants to deal with a few things um, in order that you may be put firmly together. Verse 12 and 13 of Colossians chapter 3. Let's read it together. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also... And this is what the Lord was speaking to my heart, even while praying that couples one of the foremost things you must do is forgive each other there are times when we hurt each other sometimes not even meaning to sometimes we did mean to but we must forgive each other there's sometimes when you feel like your spouse did not support you did not stick by your side you had been faithful, you had done your part, but you felt like they didn't do their part. You must be able to forgive each other. That's why in verse 12 he says, put on therefore the elect of God. He talks about bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. And the first thing we're gonna be doing tonight is we're going to enter into a time of asking God to make sure there is forgiveness in our hearts one towards another. That there would be no rough edges that would stop the binding of what God has designed in the marriage. Amen. Now the enemy, is. this is the enemy's job. It is the enemy's job to try to bind you. It's the enemy's job to, to strive to make you with rough edges. That's his job. If he, he wouldn't be an enemy if he didn't do that. But God's job, smooth out the rough edges. Bring forgiveness and cause there to be unity with each other. Amen. So, would everyone in the building right now just lift your hands to God and let's open up our mouths and begin to give God praise right now. Come on and give him praise just a moment. Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Father, we need you. We worship you right now. We love you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing right now. We thank you, Lamb of God. We love you. You're worthy. 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 I want you to do this. Grab your spouse by your hand, by the hand. If your spouse is not here, then simply imagine having them by the hand. And be, we're going to begin to pray. You're going to begin to pray that God causes forgiveness. Now, if you know you have something in your heart against your spouse, this is the time to ask God to remove it. You may not even know about it. You may think everything's fine between the two of you. There is no danger in asking God to research the matter. Amen? Because there's sometimes we don't know our own hearts. Matter of fact, the Bible states we don't know our own hearts. There's only one that knows our heart. Everybody say, that's the Lord. Okay, so the Lord knows our hearts. And it takes the Lord to speak to us. And so couples, you're going to start to pray together. Even other saints of God in the building. If you've got any unforgiveness, 
the Lord speaks to you in like fashion, that it be a time to release unforgiveness. Come on right now, begin to ask the Lord, let there be forgiveness between us, Father. Let there be nothing in my heart, any hurts, heal. Hallelujah. Any hurts, God, we need you to heal right now. Every bit of hurt, every bit of pain, heal between, every misunderstanding. Come on, some of you got strains right now in your relationships. Some of you women are upset with your husbands because you feel they don't lead. Some of your husbands are upset with your wives because you feel that they're too dominant or not supportive. Come on, God says it's time to forgive, it's time to forgive, it's time to forgive. We need your forgiveness right now, God. Yes, yes, ask God, ask God. Father, hallelujah for those spouses that are not here. We believe you to affect them right now. We believe you to deal with their hearts, their souls, their minds, oh God, whether they're saved or unsaved. We thank you right now for affecting them like only I know you can do. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Come on, we need prayer all over this building. Don't allow yourselves to be distracted from the move of God. Come on. I know there's a lot of activity going on, but come on, we need prayer. We need prayer. Come on, young people. We need your prayers. We need your prayers. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. God's trying to bring release in this house. He, he wants to bring release in this house. Yes, yes. Come on, join with us in prayer. Join with us in prayer. We need prayer from all over this building right now. Hallelujah. Father, we believe you. Father, we believe you. Let there be forgiveness in this house. One to another right now. Mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the release in the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the release in the Holy Come on, you're going to release hurts. Release hurts that have come between the two of you. Release hurts. Release disappointment. Come on, sometimes disappointments come between couples. Release disappointments. Oh, Father, release the disappointments. Bring deliverance right now. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord Jesus. Oh God, I thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Mm. Glory, 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 glory. Oh, Shama Mama We thank you for the men around them. I need about 10 people to stand up right where you are. You don't even have to come. Just stand up right where you are quickly. We need your prayers. Lift your hands right where you are. Open your mouth and begin to pray for these couples that God would heal, minister, and deliver. Yes, Lamb of God. Yes, Lamb of God. Minister, like I know you can. 
Shandala mama mama sata rebe kora mama under rebe trios dale barra ba. Sandala barra mama mama barra mama 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 kora mama mama trios dale rebe kela rebe trios dale rebe ta. My God, I were yes. I thank you for healing virtue flowing right now. I thank you for ministering to hearts, souls, and minds right now. Make a difference, Lamb of God. Heal relationships. What the devil meant for evil, make it for good. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, God, we worship you. That's it, that's it. Lord, we thank you for raising, raising them up. We thank you for healing right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, John. We thank you right now for what you've done. Ramandrioso robo randrebos terebe kila rebos. Dana mama ramandrebe bebe ndrioso terebe hilo le menki o ndrebo ramama baba 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 butara. God's calling you. God is the God of right relationships. I want to speak to the congregation just a moment at large. God's going to teach us how to be concerned about others. What happens to us is if it's not our turn to be ministered, we're unconcerned. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't affect us directly, we're not interested. And God's going to teach us how to be concerned. You reap what you sow. And if you want people to be concerned, you want prayers to be calling forth for you when you have problems, you want people to be focused when you're having difficulties, then you be focused when somebody else is having difficulty. And God will make sure you reap what you have sown. God loves somebody because God said there's still another. Brother Jonathan, come back for me. Anoint these that have just come up. Anoint their head and anoint both of their hands. Oh, God. Everybody in this congregation, we need your attention. We need your focus. It's time to pray. We need for God to heal. We need for God to minister. You may need to come up here. It's going to apply to both. But there's some of you, the devil has been whispering divorce. And he has been presenting this as your only solution. that you can't live with this, can't tolerate this. The only way to do this is get out. Now, if you're not up here and that's you, you need to be up here. And you need to be up here quick. Because God wants to minister to the whole individual. And what happens when pressures keep building that alternative keeps looking better and better. 
Now, you, your enemy does not play fair. Because what he will do is while he's whispering divorce, he'll have someone of the opposite sex treating you real nice. In a wooing fashion. He'll have others going, yes, you're right, you should do that. Now we're going to speak against that spirit right now. And we're going to stand fast by the presence of the Almighty God and take a stand against that, that God is going to do a work in this house tonight. Everybody in this place, come on, we need to speak against that spirit of divorce. Father, we speak against that spirit right now, that what the enemy has meant for evil. The Lord bless you, you may be seated. The word of the Lord directed to my heart this day. And I would admonish you to read it and consider it from 1 Kings, the 8th chapter. And I present to you one verse from this prayer of Solomon at the dedication of the temple of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. And I say unto this church that we claim every promise of God made to Calvary Pentecostal Church, and that there hath not failed one word of all his good promise. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, a day of his making is upon us, and we embrace it and we claim it in Jesus' name, and let the church say amen. amen. The ministry of Dr. Jeffers is really hard to quantify or even in some measure explain. But allow me to say to you that what we have received in the three times he has come to us is really the fivefold ministry expressed through this one minister. And I thank the Lord God for bringing us together and to try and express what it has meant to my life and my ministry, to my wife and to my children is beyond my ability to put into words. But I honor the Lord God and I thank God for this man. But I believe that the Lord spoke to my heart today. As a pastor and as ministers in a local church, we are profoundly blessed to belong to you. And by way of that assignment, you take good care of us. And we thank you for that. But as one who would travel and serve the body at large, there is not always those benefits that are extended to one whose assignment would put them and link them directly to a local body. And so I believe that the Lord challenged me today and from the word of the Lord, the story of application is behold now I perceive that this is a holy man of God which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him their bed. And a table, a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. Surely a holy man has come and stood among us. And God would give us an opportunity to provide a chamber 
a source of comfort and some measure of security, if you will. And I, I know I heard the voice of the Lord today. And so, Dr. Jeffers, this, this local body, we want to provide for you uh, the medical insurance that you should have, that all of us should have. It's just a small chamber. But we want you to have a, a source of rest and comfort. And I know we trust God explicitly. But this is in order and God will help us to bless this man of God. Praise God. Dr. Jeffers, will you come? Calvary, will you stand and receive this precious man? Come on and bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory be to God, glory be to God, glory be to God, glory, glory be to God. As you're Somebody bless God for his word. We always bless God for his word. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we just love you so much. We just love you. We just love you. You're a wonderful father. Would you open your Bibles right now to Genesis chapter 2? Genesis chapter 2. I want to thank Pastor and this wonderful assembly for such a gift. We appreciate it very much. God knows there are things that we pray about for years and leave it into the hands of the Lord and say, God, if that is your desire, then you will supply. And we thank God that he hears and answers prayer and we thank you so much for your kindness and your gift and it is a deeply appreciated amen as a servant of the lord and what a privilege it has been to be here with you this week and to see god in action nobody can do it like jesus amen 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 there is no one that can do this like jesus and so in the book of genesis chapter 2 and we're going to start at verse 20 and read down through to verse 25. We're dealing with couples tonight. And we're going to trust God to speak to the couples and to speak also to his church at large. Let's begin to read together. And Adam gave names. to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs closed up the flesh instead thereof and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man and Adam said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and they were both naked the man and his wife 
and we're not. Read verse 25 with me again. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not. And I want to speak to you tonight on that couple's naked and not ashamed. Naked and not ashamed. Would you again ask the Lord to speak into your spirit? Father, we trust you that you will speak into our spirits. Speak to the couples here tonight. Speak to the church at large, whatever the needs are. Father, I believe you will meet people at their point of need and then bring them to where they need to be. We thank you for ministering by your spirit and by your presence that all that it will be said and done will be done to bring you glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you as you're seated in his presence, naked and not ashamed. Let me start off by saying that God created or God instituted marriage. Marriage was not man's idea. Marriage was God's idea. And marriage was meant to typify what Christ or what God wanted with his people. The intimacy of relationship. He wanted his people to know him. He wanted his people to be naked with him and not ashamed or embarrassed. In this portion of scripture, we need to deal with a few things that transpires in God instituting. We deal with what we call the law of first reference. That means the first time in which it appears in the scripture starts setting a precedent and giving understanding to the other times that it may come into the scripture. We spoke to the women and we dealt with the fact that when God made Adam and then God made Eve, he made Eve out of living material. Now the Bible says that Eve came from Adam's rib. And the rib covers the vital organs of the man, his heart, his lungs. A good wife will learn to protect her husband's anointing and integrity. For you see, women, there are many times, as you very well know, that you can tell when someone is flirting with your husband. And you go, oh, honey, you just, you know, calm down. But because women tend to know women better, you can sometimes tell when someone's acting a little too friendly. Now our inclination at first is then to run to our husbands and say, you know, da 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 da. But God's training us, the first thing you do is run to God and ask for wisdom now. Sometimes you just have to pray. Sometimes the Lord will tell you, let him know. But then you will make note that the arm goes over the rib. The arm symbolizing that of the man protecting and covering his wife. Protecting her emotions. Protecting her from things that would dethrone her peace. Doing things, amen, that will assist her in maintaining her walk with God. The Bible then goes on to say, Adam, and this we covered again a little bit with the women, but we need to go over it again with the men and especially with the couples. For you to understand each other, the Bible says in verse 22 that God had taken from the man and he made he a woman and he brought her unto the man. When he brought her to the man, the Bible says in verse 23 that Adam received a revelation of who she was. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. For couples to effectively dwell together, you must receive a revelation of each other. 
Being married is not simply experiential. You cannot get into the depths of marriage simply by experience because it was instituted by a spiritual God. So there is a spiritual aspect to marriage that cannot be gained simply by experience but only comes from revelation from God. And you must ask God to reveal to me my spouse. Who did you call them to be? What is their identity? If you get a revelation of their identity, then you will not fall prey to trying to remake each other. And you will understand sometimes why your spouse is the way they are. I want Pastor and Sister Pasley to stand with me just a moment. Come right over here. Wonderful married couple in the Lord. But, but I want you to see some things by illustration. <laughs> you notice I didn't tell him about the illustration until I brought him up, right? Wisdom. <laughs> Nothing bad, nothing bad. <laughs> there are sometimes when couples say to each other, why can't you see it the way I see it? And I want you to see something. Stand face to face. If they're standing face to face or in the same direction as in to see what each other are seeing, their backs are left uncovered. Now stand back to back. When they stand back to back, their vulnerable places are covered, but they don't see the same thing. And so when God puts couples together, oftentimes he will not allow you to see the same way. He puts you back to back to cover your vulnerability. So if pastor was to say what he saw, what do you see? I see this wall and these instruments. You notice how men talk real concise. How do you see? Well, I see chairs and drywall that needs to be redone. And, um... <laughs> <laughs> Pastor checking his teeth. <laughs> Do you see anything else? Uh, you don't want me to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, I don't think they can bear any more illustrations. Thank you. I think we know God made us different, don't we? So God places you back to back and causes you to see things two different ways that you would learn to bring the two different ways together and make a whole picture. They have become two pieces of a puzzle that if you will learn to place together will give you a full spectrum. So you must learn many times to appreciate the differences of your spouse. Amen. And to do this, God has decided that you must learn the lesson that comes down into verse 25. But before you can get to 25, you've got to deal with 23 and 24. In 23, we dealt with the revelation of identity. In 24, the Bible says a man must leave in order to cleave. This is why when God, this principle that God orchestrates is to teach couples about each other. Number one, when God says leave your father and your mother, it's not just simply come out of their physical house. It's leave mom and dad out. 
What happens to a lot of husbands is they want, a, they want their mother. Well, this sure don't taste the way like my mom used to cook it. No, you were supposed to leave anyways. Leave your mother. And now you can't cleave until you leave. And that's also true with the wife. She must leave her father and her mother. And sometimes in-laws and other close to us, we can allow them to have too much input into a relationship. And there is the old adage that too many chefs spoil the pot. You have to allow God to come into control. But verse 25 and says, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were what? Now God, to bring couples, now he's dealing here with a physical nakedness, but what he's really dealing with here is that there was a transparency to each other. They had nothing hidden from each other. And God must bring couples to the point where there is a nakedness between the two of you. There is a transparency where you are open to each other and you are not afraid to be open to each other. When one becomes afraid to become open to another, they start reaching for armor to protect themselves. You cannot enter into intimacy with armor on. Somebody say amen. Now look at Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to go through some things regarding couples. Now, as you heard in this illustration, men and women think differently. Men, not all men, but generally, men tend to talk in headlines. Which is very concise. How was your day? Fine. What'd you do? Same thing. <laughs> Women want details. They tend to want to deal with details. Well, what do you mean the same thing? Did you talk to so-and-so today? Did you? Yeah. <laughs> now, is a, it is a statistical fact that men talk in, on an average about 7,500 words. But women talk 15,000. So especially if a wife is staying home with the children, for those of you that want your wives to stay home with your children, what happens is she's been talking diapers and poo-poo and... And by the time he comes home from work, he's already at 7,550. He's already 50 words over. She has hardly reached a thousand. And so lack of communication then becomes the foremost reason for divorce. Now, what God teaches in that is there has to come balance. He must learn how to open up and talk more. Yes, yes. And she must learn when to give him space, not to talk. There has to come that balance that they learn through experience and through God on the way that they have been made. Now, men tend to think along the concepts of thoughts and ideas. Men, women tend to think along the lines of relationship and feelings. So a man says, honey, I got a great idea. Let's go on vacation. The woman says, well, what about the children? She moves to relationship. He had a great idea. The man comes home saying, honey, guess what? I got a, I got a promotion. Isn't this great? 
His thoughts are all on it. Isn't this wonderful? She asked, does this mean you're going to have to work longer? Because she married you to be a part of your life. She accepts that you have to be away for a while. But if it's going to take more away from relationship, that's why many times when couples sit down to talk, the woman just says, let's talk. The man goes, I'm reading the, you know, the, dealing with the sports section. Go Bengals. No. <laughs> I got a few over here going, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was Bearcats, huh? Go. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> So men become passionate about things women could care less many times. So the woman sometimes will come and say, I want to discuss even a problem. I want to talk about something. The man sits there and listens and listens for a bit. But he quickly, men tend to be solution oriented. He quickly moves to solution. Well, honey, if you just would do this, you just stop talking to them. We wouldn't go through that. But you see, she's operating on feelings. She's just, I want to express. I want you in my world. I want you to know how I'm feeling. I want you to know what I'm going through. He's like, I really, you know, let's just get to an answer. Let, let's get to a solution and let's get this straight so that we can move on. Now, God made you different. How many know you're different? You're not just different physically, you are different mentally. And so God must teach you how to deal with your differences in order to bring him glory. Amen? Would you lift your hands again just a moment and give God some glory and praise? Yes, yes, come on, give him some praise. Teach us. God wants you to learn how to become naked and not ashamed. Transparent to each other, dealing with each other, where you are living, what you are going through, and not ashamed or embarrassed about how transparent we have become. Now, to fulfill this, we need to go also to Ephesians chapter 5. We spoke to the men on Wednesday night to let you know that God wants you to be the head of your house. The head of your house does not mean that you are a slave master. God never intended for that. And men, let me tell you this. If you want submission, you must first practice submission. God goes in order of chains of command. If you don't submit to your pastor, don't expect your wife to submit to you. This chain of command. You must submit to God, men of God, in order for your wife to submit to you. God operates under chains of command. And what happens is we have a lot of men just talking submission and do not do submission. You must also submit in order for God to be glorified. Now look at verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Not anybody else's husband, not anybody else's concepts, not your parents, but as unto your own husband. Submission, which by the way, the devil's tried to make it into a dirty word. Submission speaks about the word sub means to come under. Mission means under a goal or directive. So submission means to come under your husband's goals and directives. In other words, he is pointing out a destination and you come under that to help push the family in that direction. That's why the man has to be highly submitted to God because he has to know the destination. He has to begin to pull the family into an arena where God is leading. He must have a prayer life. I said he must pray. 
Families become out of balance when it's just the wife praying. The husbands need to pray. Amen? All right, he goes on. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. God gave to the man the headship, the leadership. That means that the man must be in sync with his God to hear what God is saying. Amen. Amen. It's tough to take headship and leadership and you hardly have relationship with God. He says in verse 25, husbands love your wife. Now, that word love there is the Greek word agapeo. Agapeo means to love out of your will. It means to command yourself to love her. When the Bible says wives love your husband, that word love is based on filio. It means be affectionate to him. Give your affections to him. Because God made women that if you do not give your affections in your love, whatever has your affections will receive your love. If you become overly affectionate to your children and not to your husband, you will find love just goes really only there. Some of you get overly affectionate about shopping. If it just goes there, that's what your love is. We call it shop therapy. And so he says, give your affections to your husband. Be affectionate to him. Put little notes in his pocket of I love you. Sometimes just come and hug him. Show affection. Because if you will display your affection, there your love will go. Can you say amen? So when he says now to the wives, love your husbands, and he says to the husbands, love your wife, I want you to know those are two separate words. He's looking for the husband to act like himself and command himself to love his wife. So sometimes what happens is what the husband has to learn, he must remain consistent, even though the wife may seem to fluctuate. So she always has a point of reference of where the middle ground is. See, with headship comes responsibility. Amen? If God wants someone to submit to you, it's because he's given you the greater responsibility. He goes down. He says, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's powerful. That is a phenomenal kind of love. That is a love that you must grow up into in maturity, in maturing in Christ, where you begin to love your spouse in such a way. I'm going to come down. Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth him. I want to tell you why sometimes we have a hard time loving each other as in couples. You don't love yourself. The Bible says love your neighbor as... If you don't love you, it's very difficult to love your spouse. If you feel unworthy, if you feel guilty, if you feel condemned, if you feel awful, that's the way you're going to tend to love your spouse. If you're critical of yourself, overly critical of yourself and hard on yourself, that's the way you're going to tend to be to your spouse. Therefore, God's got to teach you how to love you. Some of you tonight are going to have to find out, you're going to have to ask God to teach you how to love yourself so I can better love my spouse. Because if I can't love me, I can't help my spouse effectively. I'm coming down particularly into verse 29. Well, really, I'm going to reach the 30 and 31, but I'll come through 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Look at this. He quotes back Genesis. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, 
shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. 32. Read 32 out with me. This is a great mystery, but I speak. Now, the only other thing that the Apostle Paul calls a great mystery is great is the mystery of godliness. Literally, what Paul said is, this kind of math does not make sense to the intellectual mind, where one plus one equals one. The two shall become... That doesn't make sense. Therefore, he says, that if you notice when he said this is a great mystery, colon, I speak of Christ and the church. Christ and the church is separated by a colon. Because the great mystery is also in being married. That's why the word mystery means something is veiled. It is not readily understood, nor is it readily seen. To deal with a mystery, you need a revelation. It must be unveiled. That's why you married couples, you need to pray that God gives you a revelation of the mystery of marriage. How can two become one? Where is Candace? Candace, come, come, come here. They start speaking in tongues. It's just, you know. Just come sit beside your mother a moment. Now watch this revelation of the mystery of marriage. One plus one join together in union and make one. She becomes a mixture of the two who are one. So he says the twain shall become one flesh. So someone she looks at herself and she can see her father. Someone else looks at her and says, but I can see your mother. And because it is so unified, they'll say, I can see your grandmother. One plus one equals and so what God did when he made marriage is he made the ability to produce an eternal soul that will go on for eternity and will do the will of the Lord can you say amen to that thank you Candace <laughs> she's like get me out of here that's <laughs> I want to challenge you couples tonight, if I can give anything to you, it is this. You need to ask God for the revelation of the mystery of marriage. Revelation cannot be received by experience. Revelation only comes from God. And if you do not have a revelation of your spouse's identity, you need to ask for it tonight. If you do not have a revelation how the twin can become one, you need to ask God for that tonight. And God wants to teach you how to move as one, not two separate entities. What happens to a lot of married couples? The only thing that makes you married is your license. You have separate beds, separate checking accounts, separate cars, separate bathrooms. Everything starts becoming separated. There is something to the power of oneness. When couples enter into a oneness, we oftentimes see it typified by the fact that when one speaks, the other will finish it. Knows exactly what the other is going to say. I'll never forget there was this one sister, she was in England, she traveled up from Jamaica, left her husband in Jamaica to come up for a convention. And all of a sudden, one day she said, something's wrong with my husband. I know it, I feel it. They were so one, they were so connected in the spirit, that even though they were a 10-hour flight away, she knew when he was in trouble. 
That is part of the mystery of marriage. Your spouse doesn't always have to tell you everything. You know by the Spirit what's going on. Somebody lift your hands again and give God praise in the house. God wants to reveal a mystery. God wants to reveal a mystery. Come on, God wants to reveal a mystery. Somebody ought to be starting to ask God for that mystery right now. Give me the revelation of the mystery of marriage. Give me understanding. Now I need to deal with a few other aspects. Go to the book of Matthew chapter 18. We'll get to the verses in just a moment. Matthew chapter 18. Couples, you must learn that you have an enemy. Because you symbolize Christ and the church, the devil seeks to destroy you. And because you have been given the charge by God to raise up a family, the devil seeks to destroy. If he can mess you up, he can easily mess up your children. His desire is to mess up your entire lineage and generations. Some of you have trouble in your life right now because your great-great-grandfather was an alcoholic. And although you've never known him, it got passed down through your lineage. And the effects of that alcohol, you are still now living. The devil does not simply want to mess you up to mess up your marriage. He wants to mess you up to mess up your lineage. God wants to bless you, not just to bless your union, but he wants to bless your progenitory. He wants to bless your lineage. He wants to come down through dispensation. He wants to come down through your lineage. He wants to use you mightily and use your offspring and your next offspring. You're not just safe for you. Amen. God reaches out to generations. Now, what you have to understand, couples, is that because you have an enemy, the devil gets in the midst of communication. You all ready for another illustration? Hey, did you see Candace's response right there? <laughs> you saw that, didn't you? <laughs> Come on and help me a moment. Now, because the devil knows, the devil has learned some lessons. And you know where he, got, he learned them from? From God. The devil has not invented one thing. The Bible says, God says, I created evil. What the devil learned from God happened at the Tower of Babel. For Genesis, Genesis chapter 11, for the sake of time, we won't look at it. You can write it down or just make a mental note of it. Genesis chapter 11, God came down to see those that were unified and building a tower. And the Bible says, he said, what they've imagined in their heart, they will do it. How did God stop them from building that tower? He messed with their communication. By breaking their communication, he broke their unity. The devil went, oh, that's how you do it. If I can break their communication, I break their unity. Unity, you and I tie. So, face each other. Don't you just love that? <laughs> Back up just a little bit from each other. A few steps this way, a few steps hey, that way. 
<laughs> okay, it's time for them to communicate. Time for them to talk. Just say hi. <laughs> Do you remember what the Bible calls the devil? He's the prince and the power of the air. Words must travel through the air. So they go to communicate, and I stand in the middle. So now he says something, and I mess with it, and by the time it gets to her ears, she's mad. He goes, but I didn't even say that. I didn't even mean that. So a lot of you couples keep forgetting there's a devil many times that hops between you. And so you know what he does? He gets you in the blaming game. Point your fingers at each other. If you wouldn't be so needy, if you didn't need so much, if you wouldn't talk so often, we wouldn't be in, if you wouldn't spend so much, Well, if you'd open up, if you talk more, if you would be more concerned, if you... <laughs> She's telling me what to say now. <laughs> and all along, there's a devil in the middle. Yes. Going, yeah, dude, fight, fight. Yeah. Keep it going. The Bible says we wrestle not against. Thank you. We wrestle not against. We wrestle not against. Now, if you're not careful, couples, you'll get to the point where you're talking about the enemy and you're talking about your spouse. I'm sleeping with the enemy. Because you're blaming your spouse. Now we all have our little idiosyncrasies. <laughs> we all have those little things that annoy us and bother us. You must have oil. See, what stops friction, metal hitting metal, is oil. That's the Holy Ghost oil. If you're not careful, it's the little things that will drive you nuts with each other. He never puts the lid down. <laughs> Drives me crazy. <laughs> Come on, couples, we're talking real. <laughs> and so what happens is friction starts building up in relationship because there is no oil. See, when you're that unified and you're that close and you both have strong personalities, you better have some oil that flows in between you or it's going to be metal hitting up against metal. It's going to be iron wheel hitting up against iron wheel and you're going to get into the blaming game. If you're in the blaming game tonight, it's time to stop, open your eyes and recognize the devil in the middle. If the devil can get you in the blaming game, friend, he is winning the war. You've got to come out from the blaming game, and you've got to blame the spirit that tries to block communication. Now look at this in Matthew chapter 18. Verse 19. Matthew 18 and 19. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. 
if God said, if I can get two people, two or three, who will touch and agree, he said, I'll be in the midst. Now, couples, listen to me. There's nobody that can touch any closer than one flesh. If God can make you to understand that couples are one of the most powerful forces God has created in the earth. When you have bills, this is not the time to yell at each other. Sometimes one couple can spend foolishly. It's not always the wife going shopping. Sometimes it's the man. He's a toolaholic. He's got to go to Ace Hardware Store every time there's a special. He's got to buy up all the music. Got to have Hezzy. Got to have John Peak. Got to have the various artists. Got to, you know. Now what has to happen is you must learn how to touch and agree over your finances. The first thing you must do, and we need to cover this, because a lot of you couples are struggling, and you're struggling financially, but it's also because you are not enacting the plan of God in your life. Now, I'm talking to those of you that are not married as well. If you will enact God's financial plan, you will receive God's financial blessing. Say amen. All right, now let's look at God's financial plan just a moment. Malachi chapter 3. Now, many of us know this of Malachi, but we don't know the blessings that's promised in Malachi regarding God if you give. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. The number one reason for divorce, lack of communication. Break down in communication. You will find the devil standing in the middle. It is not long before you are apart, miles apart. Two, finances have been found to be one of the greatest causes of divorce. Can't take the financial strain All right, verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, wherein have you robbed me, robbed thee? In tithes and in? Now, understand something. When you don't give your tithes and give your offerings, you just might as well walk up and go stick them up, Jesus. Will a man rob God? You're robbing me. Look, listen to what he says, verse 9. You are cursed with a, you are double cursed. Now, I want to tell you why, he's, why you, it's a double curse. It's because there are double blessings in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28. You're blessed when you come in, and you're blessed when you go. Therefore, you, now you're cursed when you go in, and you're cursed when you go. You're cursed when you go to the city. You're cursed when you go to the field. Your children cursed. You can't afford not to do this. Say amen, somebody. Now look what he said. Verse 9, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. 10, bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me, test me, try me. Now hear us, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now many of you give your tithes and your offerings, but you don't claim this. That God is going to pour you out a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive. How many of you here claim that God's going to do that for you? Now, it works just like your taxes. You know how it is. If you don't claim your return, even though you have a legal right to return, you know Uncle Sam ain't giving it. 
If you don't claim it, you don't get it, even though you are legally entitled to it. And if you don't claim God's blessings in the giving of your tithes and your offerings, you don't get it. Now listen what else he promised you if you give your tithes and your offerings. Verse 11, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Now this is the only place where God says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Any other time God tells you to rebuke the devil in my name. But here God says, when you give your tithes, I'll stand up and rebuke the devil. I'll stand up and tell the devil, take your hands off of their finances. I'll tell the devil, back up. But you've got to claim that. Look what else he says. He says, he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast the fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, the fruit of the ground speaks about the fruits of your works. Remember that was dealing with harvest, that was dealing with them working a field. And so God said, when you, whatever you set your hands to do, it will now prosper. I will not allow the fruits of your works to be destroyed. Verse 12, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome or a fruitful land. That delightsome means fruitful land, saith the Lord of hosts. But you got to claim this. And if you are married, you need to touch and degree. You need to sit your bills down. Have you ever read what Hezekiah did when Zanacharip came before him and wrote him a letter and said, we're going to destroy you? He took that letter and put it on the altar before the Lord. And listen, friends, when you get bills, you need to take it and lay it down and make yourself an altar. Lay it down. If your kitchen table is the altar, the altar is wherever you're willing to lift your heart up and wherever you're willing to pray. If you will lay your bills down and you and your spouse touch and agree. God, we give up. Now, if you don't give your tithes and your offerings, you need to start because you can't touch and agree on something that God's going to curse you on. Some people come up to me and ask me to pray for their finances. One of the first questions sometimes I ask them, do you give your tithes and your offerings? Because I can't reverse the curse. We can lay oil on you, we can pray for you, but if you don't give your tithes and your, I can't reverse the curse. That's God. God said you're cursed. But if you touch and agree on your finances, God said, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive. Someone come on, grab the person's hand beside you right now, and you're going to touch and agree. Come on, couples, you're going to touch and agree. Even those people that are in the house of God that are not married, come on, you're going to touch and agree that God is going to bless your finances. God's going to bless that person's finances. I give my tithes and my offerings. You're going to supply our needs. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <sighs> Make note of something. It's not just your needs being supplied, but it's a promise of a surplus. That's the reason why some of you else don't get your, you don't get what you want, because you're only claiming your needs being met. He said, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive. That's a surplus. You know why? Because if your needs are being met, you don't have any extra to really give to God or to the work of God. So God wants to give you a surplus. He wants to meet your needs, but then he wants to overflow on you so that you have more to give to him, more to give to his work, more to do the things that he desires for you to do, and you're not hurting. Now I have more things I could teach on couples tonight, but if God can get across to couples this night that I want you to learn how to be naked and not ashamed. I want to tell you something. When you're married, you bring baggage in with you. Each person brings in baggage from their past. And it's very difficult to be naked with each other when you have baggage. When you have baggage from a bad 
relationship you had with your parents. Some of you men do not know how to treat a wife properly or do not know how to be what you need to be because you didn't have that role model. Some of you women might not know what it is to be a correct wife because you didn't have that role model. You may have grown up in an abusive situation. You may have been hurt repeatedly, but there is a God that will teach you what it is you need to do if you will simply ask him to. Would you slip your hands up again and give God praise in this house? Come on, give him glory. Give him glory. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It's time now for the revelation of the mystery of marriage. God wants to reveal how the twain should become one flesh. Now, I want to say this also. Couples, I want you to stand with me right now, and we're going to enter into something with God. First thing, couples, amen, if you're here with your spouse, grab your spouse, grab them by the hand. If your not, spouse is not here, then you're grabbing by faith and believing God to minister. But the first prayer we're going to make is to ask God to grant the revelation of the mystery of marriage and to reveal identity. Show me who am I married to. Husband, you just might be married to a Deborah. You might be married to a prophetess. You need revelation. You need to know who you're married to. Because then you will know how much to listen to certain things that are said. You need that revelation. Couples, I want you to ask God right now to give you the revelation of the mystery of marriage and to reveal the identity of your spouse to you. Come on, ask God. We trust you. Thank you for doing it right now, God. Reveal, reveal, grant the revelation of the mystery of marriage. Grant us the revelation, grant us understanding, grant us the spiritual know-how in marriage. Oh God, that our union would also be spiritual as well as natural. Help us to be tied in our spirits, tied in our emotions, and tied in our bodies. Now ask God, amen. Well, let's move to this. Husbands, just put your arms around your wives. This is something you must learn to do. And I want you to hear me. You must learn to minister to each other. It should not be something odd for you to pray for each other because you're one flesh. Husbands right now, I want you to, as you got one arm around your wife, I want you to take your other hand and put it on her forehead and begin to minister to her. Pray in her ear, let her hear you. Let her hear you pray for her. Minister to her, pray for her. Come on, you don't have to worry about no fancy words, just, just pr let her hear you. Pray in her ear. Let her hear you. Minister to her. Who 
Oh, God, right now, minister to these wives through the hands of their husbands. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. That's it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Husbands, before you're done, just thank God for your wife. Whisper in her ear. Let her hear you. Let her hear you thanking God for her. I thank God for you. I thank God for my wife. I thank God for my gift. I thank God for my rib. You are my rib. I thank God for you. Husbands, with your arms still around your wife, now wife, would you take your arm and put it on your husband's chest, and would you be now begin to pray and minister to him? Let him hear you, wife. Let him hear you. That's right. Pray for him. Let him hear you. Minister to my husband. Strengthen him, Lord. Help him to be the leader. Encourage him, Lord. Yes. Yes. Who the Lamashaya? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, husbands, wives, as you're finishing up your prayer, would you let him hear you? Thank God for him. Thank God for my arm. Come on, the arm is over the rib. Thank God for my arm. Thank God for my protection. Thank God for my husband. Thank you, God. Make us one, Lord. Make us one. Make us one. Make us one. You can be married for 30 years and still not tapped into the revelation of the mystery of marriage. Because it's not just experience, it's not experiential. It's given as a gift by God, revelation. Hallelujah. 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 Couples, if you have children right where you are, you don't, your children may be in other places, so you don't have to get them. If they're near you, wonderful. But if not, that's fine already too. But together, you're going to begin to pray for your household. 
pray that God is going to minister to your children. If you have one child, two, how many children, whatever you children you have, you know, pray for them together that God is going to minister to them. And God is going to, in this last day and age, use them mightily. And that God's going to give you wisdom like Manoah, teach us how to order our children. If you have grown children that are out of your house on their own, come on, pray for them. Pray that God, amen, if they're not saved, that God brings them in. Touch and agree. Hallelujah. 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 Shama ma ramandri a kurandri betrios na da barra baba bus da barra baba bus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We believe you to touch the children right now. Touch our children. Touch our children. Minister to them. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. Oh, Roban da la baba bo, Roban barra sheki la la baba so Roban baba da la. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, Shama. That's it. That's it. Somebody's touching God. Virtue's flowing. Power's flowing. My God. Oh, Now, come on, couples. Begin to pray together. Just worship the Lord together. Come on. Learn to pray together, couples. Learn to pray together. Learn to pray together. Yes, learn to pray together. Couples, it will help you greatly if you just learn to pray together, even just every day, just a few minutes together. Learn to minister to each other. It will release a lot of things. Some things if you will just minister to each other about, God will handle. And it won't blow up into arguments and friction and the enemy's not able to get in the middle. If you learn just to pray together. But for a lot of you, it's strange to pray together, and it ought not to be that. You're spiritual beings. Marriage is also a spiritual union. You must be learned how to be tied in all three levels. You must learn how to be tied in your spirits, in your soul, and in your bodies. That you become bonded with each other. First in your spirits. Learn to get tied in your spirits, praying together, ministering to each other, praying for one another. Praying over needs together. Not just your own personal needs. Learn how to touch and agree also for the needs of the church and other things around you for other people's needs. God will honor you.
Would you just ask the Lord right now to settle what you've heard into your hearts, couple? Just ask God to settle it into your hearts. That you may put it into practice. You may put it into practice. Help us to put it into practice. Help us to put it into practice. We believe you. Help us to put it into practice now. Help us to be aware of the devil. Help us to be aware of an enemy in the middle. Help us to get out of the blaming game. Teach us how to work with each other in our differences and difficulties. Make us one. Make us one. Make us one. You may be seated. Amen. We're coming to the end of this time of revival. And we want to thank God for all of you and all the various nights and all the various groups that we covered by the Spirit of the Lord. We believe that each group was effectively ministered to by the Spirit of God. But tonight, as we're closing, the Lord has told me that there are some that you still have special needs before the Lord. Whether you're a couple or not, we're dealing with the entire body of Christ right now. Maybe you're single, maybe you're divorced, maybe you're widowed, whatever your status is. Maybe you're a teenager, wherever you are, but that you have some particular needs before God right now. And you're wanting God to minister to you. We're going to begin to lift our hands and just worship and praise the Lord just a moment. And if you are the person that has a particular need, you need God to meet you. You need something from the Lord then I want you to come to this altar right now and we're going to believe God to minister into your life and into your needs. Come on, all of us, let's lift our hands and create an atmosphere for God to work in. Create the atmosphere for God to work in. Come on, sterilize the room. Sterilize the room by your praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have some particular need before the Lord, and you need for God to deal with you tonight. Now the God of glory is well able. I said he's well able. How many believe he's well able? I don't have to know what your need is, friend. God knows. But the Bible says to make your petition known unto the Lord. The Bible tells us to ask. Well, why do I need to ask if God knows? Because there is a humility in asking for help. What that says is, I admit I can't do it. And I admit you're the one that can. And that's why you need to ask. So whatever your need is right now that you come up for, I want you to take a few moments and ask God. If you need a healing in your body, whatever it is, you need it. Just ask God. Ask God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. We worship you right now. We praise you right now. Hallelujah. We're asking you, Father. We're asking you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Whew, my God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We know you're hearing even as they're asking. We know you're hearing. We know you're hearing. We know you're hearing. 
We know you're hearing. Glory. Just take a few more moments. Just pour out your heart to him. Just ask, ask. I'm humbling myself. I, I know you have the answer. I don't have the answer. Come on, you're admitting to God. I, I can't plan my way out of this one. I can't scheme my way out of this one. I can't laugh my way out of this one. I need you. I need you. I need you. My faith to praise God for hearing and answering according to his word. Come on. Father, I thank you for hearing. I thank you for answering me in accordance to thy word. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. And when someone has done something for you, it's time to say thank you. Maybe you haven't been here all the nights of revival. Maybe you've been in one, or maybe, maybe you're just simply thankful because you just simply know God's good. <laughs> you might not have been. This might be your first night. But we're going to stand up on our feet all over this building, and we're just going to tell the Lord, thank you. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for touching me. Thank you. Thank you for hearing me. Shama Mamura, thank you for touching me. Thank you for answering my prayer. Come on, thank God for touching your brother and your sister. Thank you, Lord God, for touching my brother and my sister. My God, my God, my God, my God, my God. Randa la baba babo roko trio sanda la baba baba babo randa la baba babo trio sanda. Yes, 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 yes. What a mighty God! Thank you. You have been so good to us. Thank you. You've answered so many requests. Thank you. You didn't have to do it, but you did. Oh, come on, open up your mouth. The Bible says clap your hands, oh ye people, and shout, and shout, 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 shout. Oh, terrible shaka. Glory. Yes. Yes! Woo! So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, corra, batana, bahorra, bababosa, perebetria, tribosa. Now would you just tell him how much you love him tonight? I love you. I love you. You are my heart's desire. I worship you. I need you and I worship you. I love you. I love you with everything that's within me. Oh God, I love you. 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 You are so good to me. You are so good to me. I love you. Hallelujah. I love you. I love you. Hallelujah. I love you. I love you. Shandala bebe kioto, ro shandala bebe kioto. Hu ro kore shandala bebe kioto, ro kota na mama she. Dere mo ro kore, dere bebe dere osita baba. 
Thank you, Almighty God, for the authority of your word. We honor you, Mighty God, for the impact upon our soul. We honor you, Almighty God. May this day be a day of memorial. May this week create landmarks for future generations of Calvary, Lord. The Lord, each one of us would build before you a memorial of thanksgiving, a memorial of remembrance, Lord, that this was the time of our deliverance that this was the day of understanding, that this was when your word brought freedom to the captive, brought recovery of sight to the blind, brought deliverance to those that were oppressed. For surely, Lord, you have anointed your man to minister. I claim, Lord, the eternal impact of your word. I believe, Lord, that in days to come, we will not digress from this apex of your making. But, Lord, you have surely laid a foundation stone upon which we will build in future days, that our prayers will not be less, but they will increase that our understanding will not wane, but it will grow, that our lives will not regress, but, Lord, they will progress in you, that tomorrow those will look upon us and say, surely something is different inside of you. Something has changed. Something has been broken. Something has been lifted. And Lord, it will create a venue and an opportunity for us to magnify you, to give you the glory. For Lord, that is what we must give you. You must have glory. That you would smile upon us. That you would give us this day of visitation. We honor you. We praise you. We thank you, God. Oh, Lord, we surrender ourselves to thee. You have charged us with great truth, with revelation. We must act upon it in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. To worship you, oh my soul, my soul rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you in your ear. All the ladies, lift your voice to the Lord and sing it to him. Man, let us worship.